Hey everyone, I realize this is a re-upload, but unfortunately Viacom took down uh, the video, which is really frustrating. I disputed it as fair use, but they rejected that as well, so this is really my only option. It would really help the video and help me, because I'm really proud of that video. I think it's one of the best Avatar lore videos that I've really ever done. It's a topic that I've been thinking about a lot. So there was a lot that went into it, and it was doing really well at like 175,000 views. It'd really help for you to just uh, put a like or a comment uh, just to give the video a bit of momentum. <laughs> yeah. But that's really all. Um, if you haven't seen this video before, then uh, in enjoy it. Even the separation of the four elements is an illusion. If you open your mind, you will see that all the elements are one. Four parts of the same whole. There's been something on my mind that a lot of people seem to be getting wrong about bending. A while ago I made a video on whether glass bending is possible, and one of the top comments is that Earth is made of carbon, humans are 20% carbon, so shouldn't a really skilled earthbender be able to flesh bend? It made me laugh, and it's clearly a joke, but it does touch on something that I have been thinking about for a long, long time. What exactly are the elements? What defines them? Where are their limits? What I mean by this is that I often get serious questions along the lines of that flesh bending one. The air is 78% nitrogen, and grenades are made of a lot of nitrogen, so does that mean that a really skilled airbender could bend grenades? You know, fire is technically controlling energy, and <laughs> if you didn't know, everything is made of energy. Does that mean that a really skilled firebender should be able to bend anything? Waterbenders can bend blood, and the brain is 75% water. Does that mean that a really skilled waterbender should be able to get inside your brain and mind control you? That, that's a real one. These questions to me miss the point of the elements. Breaking them down to this atomic level with percentages and periodical elements doesn't really fit with the lore of the show of what these elements really are and how they work. Instead it treats them like a science that can be calculated and measured and predicted in a way that doesn't reflect the more subtle and interesting way that bending truly works. We see numerous references in the show that tell us what the four elements are isn't so much defined on this atomic level, but on a philosophical spiritual conceptual level. The clearest example of this is the water healing ability that we see all throughout both The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. This is a waterbending ability, but it doesn't come from the natural atomic understanding of water as hydrogen and oxygen. This waterbending ability comes from something more subtle, the spiritual conceptual understanding of water. We all know that Avatar draws a lot on philosophy and spiritualism to define its magic system and the cultures within its world. This is just one example. Historically, and even today, water is seen as a healing or purifying force. So we get lines like this. Water brings healing and life, but fire brings only destruction and pain. Let the waters cleanse the darkness that plagues your spirit. Brian Konietzko, one of the creators, even acknowledged that this water healing ability is largely influenced by Reiki, a spiritual healing method that incorporates water as a life-giving element to help heal people. On top of this, water features in dozens of creation stories as the original source of life, and water also has very proven benefits. Sitting in steam rooms helps relieve muscle stress. We're encouraged to drink it and stay hydrated. And those who are injured, say with a broken leg, are encouraged to do exercise in a pool to help them heal. But perhaps the most intuitive understanding of water as a healing force is that it cools and helps with burns, as a thing that puts out fires, of course. So it's no surprise that our first introduction to water healing is Katara healing her fire burns without even trying, she does it incidentally. It's because of this that this would be the easiest form for water healing to express itself as a power. The association between healing and water is a long, historic, and even proven one. And it's that conception of water as a healing element that gives us the powers that we see people use in the show, the way that it works as a bending technique. It's not about what water is on that atomic level, but what it is on that philosophical spiritual level. And this paradigm can explain other things to do with water bending, like why do waterbenders have a fetish for the moon? The legends say the moon was the first waterbender. Our ancestors saw how it pushed and pulled the tides and learned how to do it themselves. You rise with the moon, I rise with the sun. 
On an atomic level, water isn't made any more potent or anything under moonlight. No. This relationship comes from how the ocean, or water, and the moon come into the concepts of yin and yang. Your moon and ocean, they balance each other, push and pull, life and death, yin and yang. In Taoist philosophy, both the moon and water are identified with yin. The water and the moon are believed to be important parts of these forces of balance in the world. They work together in opposite, but also in tandem. So it makes sense that waterbenders draw power from it, that they learn from it, that they protect it. While it does partly come from that very real, natural relationship of the moon pushing and pulling the tides, it also goes to something more fundamental about how the moon and the water work together as concepts, as spiritual philosophical ideals. Now, if this is the case, then how do the philosophical, spiritual, conceptual ideas of the other elements fit into how they work? Let's talk about air. In Season 3 of Legend of Korra, we get this incredible scene. Let go your earthly tether. Enter the void, empty, and become wind. No! Stop! Flight is an airbending ability. Of those who attain it, all are airbenders. Guru Lahima, Zahir, and the air lion turtle. And arguably Aang, but we won't get into that today. But the thing is, is that flight isn't just an airbending ability. It doesn't come from our understanding of air as 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and whatever else. In fact, we can see a clear difference between those who use airbending to levitate or fly and those using this ability of flight. We can see the spout around Roku here. No, it's an airbending ability, but it's also a distinctly spiritual ability. It involves you letting go of everything that connects you to Earth, becoming spiritually enlightened, letting go of your earthly tethers and becoming wind. And the reason that airbenders can attain this ability is that airbending has always had a strong spiritual component to it. Historically, it has been associated with freedom of the soul and spiritual enlightenment. Diogenes of Apollonia, an ancient Greek philosopher, associated air with the soul and intelligence. Living creatures live by means of air. And this is for them both soul, that is life principle, and intelligence. If this is removed, then they die and intelligence fails. More importantly, the Chinese concept of qi, a form of spiritual energy, is often depicted as associated with air. This connection between airbending and spirituality is no surprise then. Nearly all air nomads are airbenders because of their spiritual lifestyle, and likewise, their abilities will be heavily influenced by their spiritual capabilities, most notably flight. The fact that the air lion turtle is depicted as flying in the same fashion suggests that this ability is the ultimate expression of real airbending, the perfect unity between air and the spiritualism that defines it. There are also other examples of this as well, such as Janora's spiritual projection, all of these being airbender associated abilities, which don't come from our atomic understanding of air, but our spiritual, philosophical, conceptual understanding of it. Or like how Mishka can fly completely unaided, though uh, we can't catch it on camera because the cameras just shatter whenever they capture such holiness when he spreads his wings. Isn't that right, Mishka? Mishka's staying inside because it is pouring with rain in November. All hail Mishka. But let's talk about a really, really interesting one, one I've been really keen to talk about for a long time, fire. Because this is the only one that the show actively delves into and asks, what is firebending? In the end, we get this answer. I thought firebending was destruction, but now I know what it really is. It's energy and life. Yeah, it's like the sun, but inside of you. Firebending isn't really just fire, which even on a material or atomic level isn't an element, it's a combustion in the happening, also a kind of plasma. And there are a few sub-firebending abilities that we can discuss within this framework. Firstly, a really tiny example that most people would have missed, the fire divination that we see used by the Banti tribe in Season 2 of Legend of Korra. It functions in a similar way to how we know water healing works. A dark energy has infected her. We must purge it before it destroys her avatar spirit. This ability doesn't seem to be able to heal in the same way that we know waterbenders can heal, but judging by the scene, it does seem to be able to identify the chi, where it is, and what type of chi, the energy and spirit or soul inside another person. This is because, as spoken about in the show, fire is a source of life and energy. 
Philosophically, fire has often been associated with the soul. We often think about it as a fire inside us, a fire inside every single person, a little thing that can go out at any moment. Unlike the other elements, fire is often depicted or anthropomorphized as alive. And Zuko and Aang even think about fire in this way quite explicitly in the episode The Firebending Masters. It's like a little heartbeat. The philosopher Heraclitus even believed that the soul itself was half made of fire. With this fundamental association between fire and the soul or spirit of others, it's no surprise that the shaman of the Bati tribe could use firebending to measure and read the chi or the life force or the avatar spirit of Korra. But let's talk about lightning bending, perhaps the most well known and well loved sub bending technique. The weird thing is that in many ancient mythologies, particularly western mythologies, air is often more associated with lightning because, you know, it comes from the sky. Other shows like Witch or X-Men also associate it with the sky or air more than fire. But Avatar's conception of the elements isn't western, it's eastern. And that helps define where these abilities come from. What I mean is that you've heard of the term Agni Kai. And Agni is the Vedic god of fire in Hinduism. In this Eastern religion, Agni takes on three different forms. On earth as fire, in the sky as the sun, and in the atmosphere as, guess what? Lightning. Firebending isn't just fire, it's the fires of creation, the fires of life, the fires of rebirth, the principles of consumption and anger, transformation, passion, impulsivity, leadership, and sustenance. Forces all represented in fire, the sun, and lightning. How firebending was conceived for the show heavily takes from these Vedic texts, which feature these ideas in defining Agni. Once again, it's not about what fire is on that atomic level, but what it represents on that spiritual, philosophical, conceptual level. To build on this understanding of how fire works, in Agni there is a thing called the fire of digestion, which is essentially this fire we supposedly have in our stomach that helps us digest food and turn it into energy. It's part of that fire inside all of us, which makes sense of this scene. Then down into your stomach. The stomach is the source of energy in your body. It is called the sea of chi. Lastly, earth. And I saved this one till last because uh, I don't mean to be mean to all of the uh, earth fans out there. Uh, not capital E earth. I like capital E earth. That's where I keep my stuff. I mean earth bending. It just seems to never quite strike the same vein of passion that water bending, fire bending, or air bending have. But if you are super passionate about earth bending above all of the other elements, then let me know down in the comments and let me know why. Why do you, why do you like rocks? I bet the geologists are going to be out in force today. Anyways, earth bending is the least spiritual of all of the elements, and this is no coincidence because earth is the most grounded. I didn't have any black glasses, so these would have to do. Spiritualism, on the other hand, is often about lack of earthly detachment, literally in the case of Zaheer. But interestingly, earthbending is really where this table of periodic elements, atomic approach, really fails. Because dirt and earth is made of virtually anything. There is no one type of rock per se. This is why I was so hesitant in my glass bending video to say that earthbenders need a, uh, an organized or a disorganized crystalline structure. Because if we were to define earth atomically, then it'd be so broad that any earthbender would be able to bend virtually anything, flesh, bone, or your inner demons. But they can't. It'd be nice if they could bend my inner demons though. But there are some clear rules, like for example, they can't bend wood, which I've always found interesting. This may be because of the traditional Chinese five elements, and those, earth is separate to wood. Metal is also separate as an element in this pentagonal framework, but a close examination of Toph's first scene where she metal bends does tell us a lot. See, earthbenders aren't bending metal here, but the unpurified remnants of crude earth mixed into the metal. 
much like how waterbenders bend the water inside vines or seaweed. So, so in a sense, this Chinese pentagonal framework for the elements does actually hold up. They're not bending metal, they're bending the earth inside the metal. But more precisely, what is the philosophical, spiritual conception of earth as an element that might help define it in the same way we've talked through air, water, and fire? Well, there's a really interesting scene with Bumi in season two in the episode uh, Return to Omashu. And neutral jig. When you do, nothing. Neutral jing is the key to earth bending. It involves listening and waiting for the right moment to strike. You need to find someone who waits and listens before striking. Earth has traditionally been linked with the principles of being patient and honest and realistic and grounded as a person. This is why Toph's seismic sense is so powerful. It's a power that draws on Earthbending's conception as an element that is unmoving, undivided, and you have to be connected with the world around you for it to work well. Toph isn't the most powerful Earthbender in the world because when we break down the Earth to its atomic components we can find patience. It's because of that association that we've traditionally had with it with patience, waiting for that moment to strike. That's why she's a powerful earthbender, because she understands the parts of it that come from that more traditional, spiritual, conceptual understanding of Earth. It also feeds into their technique, like the firebender has to use their stomach. An earthbender must be grounded in the ground. They must stay close. They don't even necessarily have to move their feet off it, unlike an airbender who is constantly bouncing around all the time. Now, this paradigm isn't perfect. It doesn't give us exact lines where we can say this is bendable and this is not. But it can guide our answer when we're asked, is flesh bending possible for an earthbender? Probably not, because that doesn't come within the spiritual, conceptual understanding of earth earth as an element. Things like lava bending and combustion bending still raise question marks as to how they might fit into this framework, but blood bending for example, where we used to think that blood was just a special type of water that kept us alive, so maybe it does fit within this framework. I'm not saying that this is the way things are, but I think it's a better way to think about the elements, one that's more accurate to the lore of the show at least. But that is all from me, and if you want to support this kind of content and our beautiful Supreme Leader Mishka, then there's a link to my Patreon down below. Otherwise, question of the day, which subbending skill would you rather have? Let me know down below. This was a lot of fun to write, I've been thinking about it for a long time and how to put it quite into words. Oh, and, and uh, come follow me on all of my social media, links to that down below. Stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future. Oh! What?